We truly are excited about what God has and what all is going to go on here, the things we're going to learn. But really the purpose of this conference is, well, to have fun. We're going to have some fun. So learn a lot of material. There's nothing wrong with gathering information. But we got a lot of creation junkies here. How many of you out there are creation junkie? Oh, yeah. The goal of this conference is to make sure that you don't just stay a creation junkie, but you become a creation evangelist. That's the reason for this conference. We want to make sure that you are going out and telling others. Because to collect it all up here doesn't do a whole lot of good for the world out there. And the whole purpose of this is to make sure and get God's word out using the creation message. It's absolutely incredible how the creation message can be used to glorify God. It's absolutely awesome. So our first speaker this evening is Dr. Dennis Swift. How many of you have ever heard Dr. Dennis Swift speak before? Three of you. How many of you have not heard him speak? Let's see, what's next? what's next? How many don't understand the question so far? <laughs> Guys, you're going to certainly be, uh, you're, you're certainly privileged to have Dr. Dennis Swift here. Uh, he is an expert on the Ica Stones. You guys, if you go to Dinosaur Adventureland tomorrow during your tour, we'll get to see some of the Ica Stones. I don't want to take up any more of our time. So with a warm, welcome, uh, warm welcome, let's introduce Dr. Swift. Come on up here, Dr. Thank you for being here. Good. How many of you are here? How many of you are not here? Oh, well, several of you are not here. Some of you are here, but you're not all there. Well, we've got a good group here tonight. People just seem to enjoy a crowd. Have you noticed that? The bigger the crowd, the more people show up for it. You have a small crowd, nobody shows up. They say cleanliness is next to godliness. Why do they say cleanliness is next to godliness? I looked it up in the dictionary. Cleanliness is next to claustrophobia. Godliness is next to goggles. Well, that's what they taught me in seminary, to look at things in such a way that other people had not put them together in the same way. My friends say I have a massive gift for the elaboration of the obvious. For instance, why do cowboys wear spur, two spurs? If one side of the horse goes, the other side does too. <laughs> what makes Teflon stick to the bottom of the pan? <laughs> and when yogurt goes bad, how can you tell? Why do they call it a fast when it goes so slow? And do you have to brush your teeth during a fast? I was thinking the other day, why do they call them buildings when they're done building them? Why not builts or crumblings? You know, I live in that crumbling over there. You know, I never could understand how they could throw a little match out of a car window into a rainforest and start a raging forest fire and I can't get anything to happen in my hibachi with hand grenades and kerosene. <laughs> well, I was thinking the other, other day, if your knees bent the other way, what would a chair look like? <laughs> That's why I'm here, to solve a couple of problems. <laughs> why do dinosaurs, do they, dinosaurs live with man and the Nazca lines of southern Peru? From outer space, there are three things that the, you can see, for the astronauts say. Uh, one is the Great Wall of China. Uh, secondly is the Luxor Hotel in uh, Las Vegas, Nevada. And the third is the Nazca Lines in southern Peru. Are we coming through up there? Can you see that yet? There we go. This is the Nazca Lines right up here. Oh, my pointer's not reaching. The Nazca Lines is one of Earth's last great mysteries. Indeed, they've been called archaeology's most baffling enigma. This peculiar art gallery was done by the ancient Noscans from 300 B.C. to 800 A.D. It is the use of the Earth's crust as a colossal art canvas, as a gigantic sketch pad. This dramatic doodling pad is of dramatic dimensions. In fact, it's 850 square miles, 37 miles long, and 20 miles wide in the southern Peru, uh, Peruvian desert. You can see the line stretching across there. In fact, 
the lines are laser straight. They follow perfectly the curvature of the earth. The longest line is 15 miles. It is laid out in arrow accuracy. There are more than 1,300 triangles, trapezoids, rectangles, zigzags, spirals in a geometric melange, an extraordinary spectacle of stupendous proportions. The lines, when they come to a mountain, they stop, and then they proceed exactly on the other side in a linear path. They were done by the Noskins, as I said, between 300 B.C. and 800 A.D. As they are using the Earth's skin as this humongous etch-a-sketch pad, they did on the desert a, an exotic parade of animals. Uh, they are of colossal proportions. We have a whale that is 100 meters, the length of a football field. We have the hummingbird here that's of 640 meters on a plateau more than two football fields length, a pelican of 900 meters, three football fields in length, and you have to fly over them from the air to look down at about 1,000 feet to see them. Here's the proportions of the hummingbird, which was the ancient Inca's uh, messenger to the gods, and a 747 airplane in comparison. This is indeed a scientific mystery. Who were the Noskins? The Noskins were pre-Columbian Indians and inhabited the Altacama Desert. And uh, they were with the Ica ICA, before the Incas, I-N-C-A, the Tiwanakos, the Wari, uh, the Mochi, many other Indian tribes. Just like in the Bible, you know, you have the Hittites and the Amorites and the Pezzarites and the, and the, and the Termites and all the different groups. They wore a kaleidoscopic costume of colors, brightly arrayed. They were very Asiatic looking, like uh, modern m people from Mongolia would look like. Uh, one of the vases we found down there had all four races of people, the different people's faces on there, uh, black and red and yellow and white. And at Tiwanaku, the great civilization up in the Andes, outside of La Paz, Bolivia, they have in the courtyard of Tiwanaku stone faces of the Celtic-like people, of Amara Indians, of Negroid people, and Europeans. Long before Columbus ever arrived in America, they were aware of the different nationalities. Now, I'm not going to here to solve all the mysteries about the Nazca lines, but uh, Eric Don von Donneken uh, postulated that they were alien airfields that ancient astronauts came down, constructed these airfields, and that God was an ancient astronaut and the Saucerine people came down and constructed these airfields. Well, my favorite theological word for that is baloney. That's not how it happened. Uh, the Noskins were highly advanced people, and technologically they laid these lines out. But the question is, did they glide over the lines? There was uh, reports when the conquistadors came the monks with Pizarro mentioned that in the 1540s that they saw the Incas gliding over the jungles in glider-like things, apparatus. Then Antonio Calancia, who was a friar in 1638 in his book, The Civilization of Peru, he writes that they also talked about the Incas having these apparatus where they could fly like birds. And from out of the Andes, what a trip would take several days, they could do in a few minutes. Is it possible that they could glide? Or is that just a mythological construct? I, I searched through thousands of vases in the Peruvian museums and come across this one is a mochi vase. The mochi people from the northern part of Peru from about six, 300 A.D. to about 800 A.D. This vase is 600 A.D. Do you look at that? That's incredible. Can you see it clearly? Look at those wings outside. He got his hand on a strap, like on right here. He's in a posture of flying like this. And in the National Aeronautical Museum of Peru, they have a vicus vase of a guy who's flying as the first example of early flight. The, uh, the monks, the priest in the 1570s down in Mexico. They also recorded that the Aztecs constructed flying type apparatus uh, out of stork feathers and other things where they could glide for a ways. And the Polish 
archaeologist Professor Tannenbaum, uh, 1934, excavating out of Tiwanaku, uh, Tiwanaku uh, ruins uh, in Mexico. He found a rock engraved on that stone was an Aztec with these wings like. Is it possible? It may be. Uh, I actually took this vase out of the museum cabinet and held it there. This vase from about 680 and was allowed to take photographs of it. Make sure you hit the target. <laughs> You're flying. Now, when all of these animals, dry geoglyphs that are carved on the desert, I was flying over there in a small airplane and they would open up the windows at 65 miles an hour. You could almost get sucked out. At that speed, you could be going to a drown draft and crash on the desert. But if you'll look here, you will see that there's a man and two animals. The animals are dinosaur-like. One of them looks like a Pachycephalosaurus. And on that is about 60 meters long. See that? The next one, as we're flying over, like Calvin and Hobbes, we look down, and here is a dinosaur neck and covering over the ridge of a mountain, maybe 100 meters. There's two others that we've discovered down there. It's a fact of such archaeological significance that a year ago in the summer, the National Congress of Peru had a meeting in the Nazca to discuss these discoveries, not the main lines, the Nazca lines, just above on Rio Palpa, Nazca. Uh, a National Geographic film crew that I was with down there, we were standing overlooking some of the Nazca lines, and the head archaeologist uh, was discussing this, and he called it the Dennis theory, that dinosaurs and man had to live together. And he said, I believe it has to be true, because the Nazcans drew the animals they were familiar with. Now, this is all going to tie together tonight. Is anybody out there still breathing? Oh, that's good. You know, because every Sunday I have 30 minutes to wake the dead at the church. So, so I want you to stick with me a little bit because this will all tie together with the Eka Stones in a minute. Now, this is Paracas. It looks like 200,000 square miles of kitty litter. The Atacama Desert, this is only about 100 miles from the Nazca Lines. All of the Atacama Desert is so devoid of plant life, there's absolutely no, almost no measurable moisture. It's the driest place on the planet. And consequently, down by Paracas, there is the candelabra. Now, Eric von Doniken said that this was a beacon lighting, guiding the ETs, extraterrestrials, to Nazca lines. Uh, if it is a beacon, they got several problems. Why would the uh, ancient astronauts need a primitive thing on the side of a sand dude, 68 stories high, to show them the way? They'd have navigational devices. Number two, if you follow the direction from there, it deviates by so many degrees that you would miss the Nazcan lines by 150 miles and they'd be lost in space. And you could only use it uh, during the day because at night there's no lights. This is really a breathtaking magnitude when you look in the Paracas Bay and look up at that 68-story candelabra. Some people try to say it's a trident. Well, really, I think I have solved the mystery of this. It is really a plant from the jungle. Look at it closely. You'll see the pods and so forth on the sides. And they drew a desert, pl uh, they drew a, a plant from the Amazon, maybe in hopes that it would grow there someday, that it would rain. Now, on the Paracas Peninsula, there was a discovery made in the 1990s that I was alerted to, and I went down there. And you will see here in this rock, if you look closely, there's a human skull, white. Next to it is a skull in the stone. Can you see that? That stone in the skull, and there's clams inside of this stone, and there's a turtle there that's fossilized that's supposed to be extinct about 150 million years ago. So I brought a team down there, Don Patton and Dave McQueen, and we researched it, but now it has been vandalized. It's been taken away. Uh, this report was given at the Geological Society of America in 1997 in Salt Lake City at the Salt Palace, and the secular geologists just snickered when we started to present this, and then when the evidence was presented, they lapsed into a profound and prolonged silence uh, without an answer. And this was reported in the abstract of the Geological Society of America in 1997. Now, on the Nazca Desert, there is this figure of a spider. The spider is 150 feet long, 46 meters. It is one continuous line of one and one half miles. What is incredible about the spider is, if you'll notice, 
The third leg up there is extended. Also, it has no eyes. What's so important about that? It is the rarest of all spiders, the Reconilia species, that's less than one-tenth, about one-eighth, one-tenth of an inch. It's barely detectable by the human eye. But during reproduction, it extends the third leg. And at the end, it's, the tip of it is a spermophore. And they're about 1,000 miles away in the Amazon in caves, and they are sightless. We did not know this until 1959 with the use of a high-powered microscope. They were able to see for the first time the extension of the third leg. The Noskins, in order to draw this, must have had some way of seeing this phenomenon. I'm saying to you, that's nothing short of startling. One professor at Boston University said it is the most incredible thing he's ever witnessed, that the ancient Noskins could spy on the sex life of the arachnid spider. Did they fly over the desert in balloons? Jim Woodman and Julian Knott went down to Nazca, and they found fabric and in that fabric, it is the most tightly woven fabric in the world, the Noskins and the Paracas people from 1,400 to 2,000 plus years ago. Uh, this shirt, for instance, is probably 70 to 90 threads per square inch. Uh, a modern parachute somewhere between 185 and 200 threads per square inch. Uh, their fabrics were regularly 220 plus, with some of them 396 and above and the most I've ever heard is over 600 threads per square inch. They also found pieces of pottery with balloon-like looking apparatus on it. So they went down there and duplicated it. And over burn pits, they sent up a balloon. Condor 1, 1971. Saying that it's possible that the ancient people had some knowledge of flight. Maybe they did construct hot air balloons. There was a Spanish priest in the 1600s that was in the jungles of the Amazon of Brazil. And he witnessed that the natives, they made hot air balloons, little hot air balloons. And he went back to Rio de Janeiro, Brazil, and he made a hot air balloon and he flew it. And if you go to Rio de Janeiro, there is a monument to that priest as a statue. And he did it 300 years before the first hot air balloon by the French. Is anybody still breathing out there? This is one of the Ica stones, but we also know these people had a complex calendar like the Mayans. The Mayans had the most intricate calendar in the world. While we have to have a leap year every four years, their calendar was almost exactly right. I'm flying over the Nazca edge of the desert. Like I said, there's nothing growing out there. But if you were to put your ear down on the ground in certain parts of the Nazca desert in Atacama on the Nazca lines, you would hear waterfalls underneath the desert. The Andes, from the Andes, the water flows down and goes underneath. And there are natural aquifers. Okay? It may be that many of the lines are pointing to sources of water in the desert. And some of them were sacred pilgrimage paths that they walked upon and made uh, sacrifices of pots. They would break them to the rain gods and so forth. But these are, the Noskins built aqueducts, canals to connect to the natural aquifers from about 500 AD, approximately these are. And so I'm flying in a small airplane and we're coming in to the edge of the desert. You can see it's green around there because of these canals. And they would be able to go down inside, no matter what level of the water, they could go down and get water. The Shamu people in the Noskins had the most advanced hydraulic engineering. It was the Amer American U.S. Car Army Corps of Engineers. It wasn't until the 1960s that they could make canals as intricate as they could. The Chamu and the Noskins figured out the rate of water flow, how to keep it going at exact speed, how it wouldn't become stagnant, and many of the Chamu can canals are still in operation today. They were a highly advanced technological people. Now, in the southern Noskin Peru, there are literally hundreds of thousands of tombs that have been looted by the Waqueros. And uh, the Waqueros, uh, they are tomb looters. And as they loot the tombs, they leave the mummies, the bodies, out on the desert. So you can see these mummies in different places near cemeteries. 
And we're looking down into a Noskin tomb, and you can see a mummy down there. And these fabrics are remarkably preserved. In fact, you'd think they were 10 years old instead of 2,000 years old or 1,500 years old. Because once they sealed the tombs and put them down in there with a, a wood roof and three feet of sand with no moisture inside, it stays that way and it's almost virtually untouched by bacteria and other things. So they're the most prized fabrics in the world. Go on the internet and look it up and you'll see that people pay tens of thousands or even hundreds of thousands of dollars for Paracas and Noskin fabrics. So we're looking down into some of the tombs and if you'll look closely, you'll see one of the stones to the right there that's inside the tomb. This is a Tiwanaku mummy, a child, about 2,000 years old. See the, the, the fabric? In fact, when you open up some of the tombs, you see crouching cor corpses staring back at you. Shriveled ears, but their eyes are still there. You put a little water on their arms and legs. I was with National Geographic doing a, a filming down there at Chincha Icha some, in some excavations. They wanted me to take them there. And I'm telling you, it's just incredible when you open up one of those tombs and look down in those, and see those people. Um, there was this 85-year-old lady. She went out on a date with a 90-year-old man. And when she got home, her daughter said, how did it go? He said, well, I slapped him three times. She said, why, did he get fresh? She said, no, I thought he was dead. <laughs> well, when you look in these tombs, huh, friends, you say, oh, these people look like they're alive. <laughs> uh, it's uh, just so uh, fascinating. Now, this is a piece of fabric. It's Noskin. It was found uh, three or four years ago. And uh, it has dinosaurs on it. It's a mantle piece. Boy, this is the secret weapons. I'll see you got ammunition all over here, hand grenades, torpedoes. This is to blow up evolutions right here. Um, the secret weapon table. This has six dinosaurs on it. There are three on each yellow, green, and white. Can you see them? Uh, this was wrapped around a mummy. It is authentic. One museum has offered $100,000 as a starting price for it. It's not for sale. It's, I don't even own it. It belongs to the Queen of Beaverton. The Queen of Beaverton. No, it does belong to the Queen of Beaverton. Yeah. Hello out there. Is anybody, you haven't heard of the Queen of Beaverton? Okay, good. You see this uh, fabric? Here's another one we got in 98. It also have a dinosaur-like image. Now, this is going to tie together. You have... The, the Nazca lines all together, Paracas Peninsula, the Nazcan tombs, and the Ica stones. This is Dr. Javier Cabrera and the Ica stone collection in Ica. There are over 11,000 plus stones. I met him several years ago, and while I was there, I was trying to acquire a stone. He would not sell one at the time. And he showed me pictures. He sent a giant stone to the Queen of Spain. He sent another stone to the Queen of Sweden. He sent a stone to Shirley MacLaine. And I said, well, you haven't given one to the Queen of Beaverton. And he said, well, who's the Queen of Beaverton? I said, my wife. <laughs> and he said, by all means, she shall have a stone. That's how I acquired the first stone. Well, these 11,000 stones plus stones, many people try to dismiss them and say, well, they all came from Cabrera. First of all, let me say, in 1535, a Father Simeon traveling with Pizarro uh, during the Ica province, he's the first one to note the strange and grave stones of Ica in 1535. In 1562, stones were shipped back to Spain. In 1571, uh, Juan de Pachara, say that fast because I can't pronounce Spanish, he wrote in 1571 about the stones. In 1941, the famous archaeologist Jose Tellio, unrivaled as the best of all Peruvian archaeologists, world renowned, he found an engraved stone beaker with animals on it in 1941. In 1904, Dom Pedro Cabrera found a stone. Now among this collection of stones, 
This is a museum that scares scientists because in the collection there are stones of dinosaurs and man together, dinosaurs in combat with man, dinosaurs standing alone. There is also incredible brain surgeries, heart surgeries, cesarean sections. There's telescopes and other things. All kinds of images on the stones that people say that's preposterous, it's ludicrous, that cannot be true because ancient men did not have those. Some of the stones have the condor and the monkey and the spider, just like the Noskin lines. Now here, we have one of the stones with a warrior type Ica person. Now the reason why they're called Ica stones is because there were ancient Indians called Ica from about 200 BC to 1200 AD approximately. Also, the Wari Indians were in that region, Tiwanaku, Noskin, all in those general perimeters, and also the, now the modern town of Ica itself. In fact, Dr. Javier Cabrera's ancestors, Dom, Pedro, Geronimo, Darquia, Cabrera, settled Ica in 1570, okay? So there's a long lineage of this. Dr. Cabrera himself was a medical doctor. He was a professor at Gonzaga University in Ica, Peru. Is anybody still interested in this discussion tonight? Whoa, this is an exciting crowd. I say, wow, I'm so excited, I'll say it backwards, wow. All right, is it possible? Because Peruvian archaeologists and others say that ancient man did not have telescopes. Well, wait a second. Mary, Marilyn Childs Denny, who was the first person in the United States to get a degree in archaeoastronomy, she worked at the Denver Planetarium. She was recovering from an illness, and she was rummaging around in the back of the Denver Natural History Museum, and she found 18-inch cylindrical tubes and evidence that they had mirrors, that they used them for reflecting telescopes, that the Mesoamerican Indians in Central America, South America, used telescopes to look at the heavens. The Mayans... They have over 400 references in the codices to the various planets. The Mayans not only constructed soaring pyramids, magnificent cities, but astronomical towers like at Chicha Icha. In fact, they speak of smoking mirrors that were black, polished mirrors. The Mayans record in their codices of Uranus and Neptune. We could not see Neptune until 1846 with a telescope. How did they do that without a telescope? They were aware of the rings of Saturn. You have to have a high-powered telescope to see the rings of Saturn. Do you know what the best scientific theory of what the rings of Saturn are? It's the accumulation of all the airline's lost luggage. I was in the airport the other day. I said, can you send this piece of luggage to Denver and this piece of luggage to Honolulu? They said, no, we can't do that. I said, why not? You did it last week. <laughs> I want to go every place my luggage has been. <laughs> have you noticed at the airport, you get to those metal detectors and things, they have you take out your wallet, they have you take out your keys, they have you take out your change, they have you take off your belt. Makes me want to go back to my old job as a stripper. Taking paint off cars. Taking paint off cars. Ho, ho, ho. Oh, okay. So did they have astronauts? The, the, the Mayans were competent astronomers. Galileo, if there's any Italians here tonight, did not invent the telescope. In fact, Chinese Emperor China in 2283 B.C., he arranged lenses, optical lenses, to gaze at the planets. The Carthaginians in the 4th century B.C., in the excavations in 1869, you see, there is a bias, folks. You know what? We are so conceited. We believe that just a few thousand years ago, our ancestors were cowering in caves, beetle-browed, bow-legged, barrel-chested, hairy-backed brutes, club-carrying, peanut-brain, drooling, knuckle-dragging savages. And that we, bionic brain moderns, are the latest and greatest. And they were mental morons in comparison. And because of that bias, we don't always look at the evidence. 
So we see here that there's ample evidence, even though about 98% of the ancient liter literature has been lost, in the 2% we find various references to the use of telescopes. And here is the Carthaginians used it for military purposes in about the 4th B.C. They spied on the enemy using, they called it a dystrophia, a kind of telescopic device. Here we have at the Athens Museum a piece of pottery with a Greek person on it looking through what else? A telescope. Strabo in 28 AD, in his journeys into the world, he talks about looking through these devices that could expand and he could see the coastline of Spain. Roger Bacon in the 13th century notes that he invented a telescope. He called, refers to earlier references of Caesar when the Romans were going to invade Kent, England, that they looked across the English Channel over 20 miles and could see what was going on over there. And secular archaeologists laughed at that. They scoffed at that. They lampooned it. And now we have found lots of Roman lenses at the Temple of Artemis, for instance, in Turkey and in other locations. Hmm. The Vikings had telescopic devices. Now at Gotkov Island, uh, some Swedish archaeologists have found th over 300 lenses. And these lenses are elliptical. With almost perfect precision. There is a process, I call it toroidal, I think it's called a process, that we did not develop until about 1900 to 1920 where you use a lathe and can you make elliptical lenses. This is those kind of elliptical lenses. In March of 2004, the U.S. Army got a tip that Saddam Hussein was hiding proton torpedoes, weapons of mass destruction near Babylon, the ancient city. They began to excavate. And as they were excavating, they found weapons. Did you know that? Yes. Swords, spears from 750 B.C. As they dug deeper, they found an astronomical tower from 600 B.C. along the other side. And there's a parabolic mirror that was polished. It has a truss tool, an azimuth mount. It's not a reflecting, but it's a refractor telescope almost 2,000 years before Newton developed such a telescope. They have all these cuneiform... It's in my book that's coming out soon. <laughs> soon. Soon. <laughs> And all the cuneiform texts that they're now deciphering, they found that every 90 years they were studying the planets and trying to follow out the observed circulation, motion, and so forth. What was Daniel? He was in Babylon, right? What were the Magi? Many of them were astronomers. Intelligent group here tonight. Now the magnifying glass. This is an ecostone, and please, oh, they didn't have. Well, what about the spider? How did they see the spider? I found a text in the 1540s when the Spanish conquistadors came and conquering the Incas. You know what they discovered? They, they mentioned this in some of the old texts. They mentioned that the Inca people had these concave, concave cups on their bracelets, and they would focus them, and the sun would start fires. Now, if they understood that process, is it feasible that they did not also understand how to use magnifying glasses? You're seeing this the first time here tonight. Many of the scoffers and the, and the critics will say, absolutely not. There is no evidence of anybody else finding any of these stones in tombs. Well, Pisa Acerto, who was the director of the Regional Museum of Ica, he is a Peruvian archaeologist. He was the director from 1963 to 1968 in independent excavations in an official with Alberto Calvo and Okahaje in Noscan and Tiwanaco and Ica tombs. He found stones. He found a stone of a five-toed llama. I've had it translated from the Spanish. And 
also a species of this fish that was supposed to be extinct over 100 million years ago. Now we're looking into a Noscan tomb. You will see that they, some of them were built with adobe, adobe material like this, a layer of rocks, a Baroque type roof with, and then you'll see there down below a stone, an engraved stone. It has a dinosaur and a man on it. This stone was found just a few years ago. Can you see that stone? You will see a concentration of saltpeter. Heavy concentration. Now normally in the tombs, when you have these artifacts, many of them have no patina on it, no weatherization, because you don't have moisture. In fact, in the American Southwest, F.G. Cawley, in his work, there's many things that we find in the American Southwest with the Indians that has no weatherization, no patina on it, even though it's over a thousand years old, or very little patina. So many of the stones do not have patina that much or weatherization. But this stone, because it was by an ancient irrigation canal, some moisture was getting into the tomb. Modern farmers still do the same ancient irrigation fields. And uh, Giuseppe Orfica, who is a famous Italian archaeologist, Noscan authority, he's written books on the Noscans. He was involved in this, the head archaeologist. I was involved in this process with this stone. Now this stone has saltpeter, heavy concentrations. That takes hundreds of years, at least. It has lichen growing on it. That's supposed to even take like a thousand years or more. Also on top of that, the stone has... The mummies, when they're put in the tombs, sometimes about three and a half cups of blood and body fluid will seep out. If it gets on anything, it's called a burn. Now many things, that doesn't happen that way. When the fabrics come out, there's not a burn because there's not a leakage of body fluid. But for instance, just for a night here is Chichi Icha. You will see here, unmistakably, some blood stains. This is a burial shroud from over a thousand years ago. Can you see it? Now on this stone, I'm shutting down every critic of the stones right here. This is a bombshell, this is a blast, this is a demolition zone right here, because they can't get around this evidence. I offer $500,000, including tax, license plates, federal plates, digital surplus, and handling with coupons for anybody can take a couple of stones here, any one of them, by any pre columbian authority, by any analysis, and get to disprove it. But if you'll see right here, this stone was next to the mummy, and some of the fluid leaked out right here. This is a blood stain. No doubt. From the mummy. It's impossible to fake. Are you glad I came tonight? I'm glad you came too, if there's nobody here. <clears throat> it's like uh, this guy is always falling asleep in church. And the pastor, one Sunday, while he was sleeping, he said, everybody wants to go to heaven. Stand up. Everybody stood up. The guy was still sleeping. Real quiet, he said, no, sit back down. And then he shouted, now everybody who wants to go to hell, stand to your feet. The guy stood up. And he looked up and said, I don't know what we're voting for, Pastor, but it looks like you and me are the only ones for it. <laughs> in China, you know, when they, people got tired, they would stand up. When everybody was standing up, they'd go home. You're not tired yet, are you? All right. This is the microscopic analysis of that stone. You can see the weatherization, the patina. Here's one of the images. There's two dinosaurs on it. Dermal spines. Uh, the, the, the graphic there that you see, the little indentations are just uh, the way, the pattern of what a dinosaur might look like. Now this is upside down, but in the Cabrera Museum, there are petrified poles, like totem poles. And on this one, there's, there's a couple of them that have dinosaurs on it. They're rock hard. They're over a thousand years old. Brain surgery. Some of the stones depict an operation with the people laying down, a surgeon taking different tools and operating on the brain. Faye Marley in Science News, November 1966, page 266 says that long before Columbus arrived in the Americas, medicine men in Mexico and Peru were forging ahead with brain surgeries, heart surgeries, cesarean sections, amputations, bone transplants, and a host of other things, and treating diseases that are still confounding modern science. 
R.L. Moody. You know, there are even medical doctors that have looked at these stones, and they say, that can't be possible. Why, Dr. Whistlebritches? Because I went to Stanford Medical School. Did you ever study ancient medicine? No, but I know they could not have done that. Well, all right. R.L. Moody, the great paleopathologist, he wrote that it's correct to say that no ancient race of people anywhere in the world developed such a knowledge of surgeries, a vast surgical knowledge, that they attempted amazing surgeries, amputations, excisions, trephining, bandaging, bone transplants, catheterizations, etc. That's pretty impressive, don't you think so? Well, these are, they use bandages as good as gauze, as good as ours. This is from a physician's tomb. You know, physicians are always burying their mistakes, so this time we found the physician. <laughs> this gauze and bandages is from three to 500 B.C. It's real, it's authentic, and it's soft, it's beautiful. I mean, it's decayed a little bit, the colorization. Isn't that amazing? And they use gauze and bandages. <clears throat> I probably have the finest collection of pre-Columbian medical instruments in the world. Here we have tumies, bronze, needles, and so forth, obsidian knives, different tools that they perform the surgeries with. This one has a wafer-thin obsidian blade. National Geographic, back in September of 1981, did an article uh, on, this, on these kind of obsidian knives. And they said that the obsidian knives used by the ancient surgeons, when you look under a microscope at 10,000 magnification, they are sharp, keen, no pits. But modern surgical steel scalpels have little pits and dents in them. In fact, Donald Crabtree, an anthropologist, when he had open heart surgery, asked for these kind of instruments to be used because... And they were, obsidian knives, because it left less bruising of the tissue. And it healed faster. I'm not saying they surpassed us in every way, but in some ways they were quite astute and knowledgeable. So this does not discount the authenticity of the Nazca stones, the Ica stone. Trephining, where they open it up for surgeries. In the mummies at Cusco, we find evidence of surgical sutures right here. And we know that somewhere between 60 to 82% of the patients lived based on the healing right around the outside. European doctors, when they first saw this, came over in the 1860s, and many modern people said that can't be because they did not have such a success rate. At Paracas, 46% of the skulls we find have trephining. There were many battle wounds. There's also some evidence that when you do this and leave at least one hole, that it increases your knowledge, atmospheric pressure. I, I'm not an expert on this, okay? You know what this is? It's airhead refueling, okay. <laughs> I don't know. But they did have some real amazing knowledge. Here's another guy. <laughs> Maybe it could be... It could be they were x-rays of evolutionists after a debate with Hovind. Okay. <laughs> oh, here's heart surgeries. Yes, they have. Uh, uh, years ago, in, there was a, a, in a 15, in 1972, there's an article in the Peruvian Times. They said, wow, there's these cardiac surgeries and everything, and they're so intricate and all this. Well, we're not doing those kind of surgeries. This was 1972. We're doing those kind of surgeries today. The Marbajan expedition to Turkmenistan in 1960s, they found in the Central Asia in Turkmenistan Neanderthal skeletons. In the official report, the USSR Academy of Science, eight of the skeletons gave undeniable evidence, evidence of open heart surgery. They went through the cardiac window, they used forceps, pushed the troponin, and that they healed because there's bony, fibrous tissue deposits on the outside. The conclusion of the Russian report was this. They must have lived five to eight years afterwards at least because based on the amount of the bony deposits around heart, that they had some knowledge of heart surgery. In the prestigious British journal, Nature, Journal of Science, 
They have an article about the Chimu who were contemporaneous with the Noskins. They found uh, different surgical tools, uh, I can't remember one of the words that can pronounce. Anyway, a couple of very uh, instruments that are virtually identical to what we use for abortions. And in that journal, they said they must have performed abortions. This is Nature, the journal Nature, Science Journal, uh, volume 1003. Okay, here's some of the skulls. They, had, they had patterned it with, uh, some of them are like Egyptian type skulls. They had the rounds of the skulls. Deformation of the skull. skull. And all reasons, I don't know. Here's another laying down. Abner Weisner was a medical doctor, and he went down to Central America and Mexico. And over many years, the, the, the different people, Aztecs, Olmecs, they would make clay statues, and they had people on these tables. It looked like they'd been strapped down, and whatever diseases they'd be treating with, they put it in the clay, modeling the clay. Isn't that astonishing? And they buried it in the graves. And they used to be on display at the National Medical College in Washington, D.C., and out of that, they saw that they were treating all kinds of diseases, all kinds of medical remedies, and having a degree of success. Now, if they were doing that in Central America, putting it in clay, burying it in the tombs to let us know what they died of or what they were treating, isn't it not possible they could do it in stone and bury a library down in Peru? Another, they also had adagens and, and to, to re, for, so you won't have rejection when you have surgery. Dinosaurs and man. We see in the collection about three or 400 dinosaur stones. They have dermal spines along the back. That wasn't discovered by Stephen Zirkus until 1992 in the geology. It was written. that You know, many of the textbooks today are wrong that they don't have smooth backs. They had like an iguana, a frill along the back, either the top, bottom, different, very much similar to an alligator. You know, you see little ridges along the back, so it would be a little bit higher. Are you still with me? Well, I'm having fun. Here's another dinosaur in Manstone, another one of a triceratops. They also correctly depict the dinosaurs standing up like this, reaching up to the, to the trees on their hind legs. We didn't know that until 1986. Robert Bacher in his book, Dinosaur Heresies, is now an established fact that they could, before 1986, let's say, if these were falsifications, if these were frauds, why would they have depicted them that way? Why wouldn't they depict them like the books that they would look at? Also, the heads. You know that there was no such thing as a brontosaurus. That in 1978, that Marsh put the wrong head on the wrong body. And then in 1978, under a lot of pressure, they switched it and put the right head on the wrong body. It's called an apatosaurus. Now, on many of the stones down in Peru, in the Ica collection with Cabrera, the stones are correctly depicted with a Slender head, not a fat head. If they were looking at books from the 1950s and 1960s, they would have depicted wrong. Dermal spines again. On the back. There was an article in the Creation Magazine called Stony Suspicions, that the stones could not be correct because we know now that the, the tails are on the ground, are sticking out when they walk. They're not, and in the Ica stones, they are curved down to the bottom. Remember Johnny Carson when he used to play Swami and had the hat on, and, and Ed McMahon, his sidekick, would say, well, you've said all there is to say about culture and ancient man and everything. That's all there is to say. And Johnny would say, wrong, brontosaurus breath. <laughs> well, wrong, brontosaurus breath, because these do have the tail sticking out. This is one of the stones. I'm down there a year ago, and here's the stones with locomotion. They have the dinosaur tail sticking out. I took a, a USB digital microscope. It looks like a little hair dryer. Uh, forensic laboratories, criminal laboratories use them in the United States. And uh, when they use them, uh, they can magnify from 10x to 200x power. And we did a scientific investigation with the independent deal. They selected different stones. We would look, hook up the microscope and flash them on the screen and do an analysis. It showed that there were lichen growth. It showed that there was patina in the grooves. Before that... I had a stone made by Basilio. Basilio is supposed to be the forger who made all these stones. He's a poor peasant living in Okahaje in a ramshackle shack with no modern convenience, making about 8 to $20 a month. And Basilio, I asked him to make me a stone. It takes about six to eight hours to make a stone. He used a hacksaw blade. 
Now he's illiterate, now he's deceased, but he was illiterate, had no education. He only knew about one species of dinosaurs, like a diplodocus. He didn't know about other species of dinosaurs. I had him make me a stone, a Basilio original, a bogus boulder. He used a hacksaw blade, carving it, took him six or eight hours. He would draw with a, a lead pencil or a blue th ink pen type thing and draw it and then make it. He'd sell it for tourists to make a few bucks. And many people say, Basilio is the guy who made all these. Well, it takes him six to eight hours to make one stone, all right? And there's over 11,000 plus stones. If he made the stones at an average of six to eight hours, and believe me, I knew him for a number of years. He'd only make one or two a month. And many of the stones, he'd put a Coke machine next to a dinosaur <laughs> or a car. He doesn't know about evolution. Put them in cow dung, and leave them there for a while, and Sell them to tourists for a few souls, Peruvian money. It would take him 375,000 working hours. That would be 31,252 days. He would have to work 12 hours a day continuously for 85 years to produce 11,000 stones. You're still breathing. So I had a Basilia stone, I had a Cabrera stone, I had this stone, I took it to independent libraries for, uh, independent laboratories for a blind test, I took it to the Mason Optical libraries, uh, uh, Laboratories, I blundered that one, I extenuated the wrong syllable, I got my nose fixed, now my tongue doesn't work. What is this clock for? This thing keeps ticking down, I'm afraid I'm going to get blown up. What's, is there live explosives up here? I took off my watch and discovered I had all the time in the world. You know what it means when I take off my watch? It just gives me more liberty with my arm. Down in the Philippines, when you preach down there, they call the, the, the watch the God on your wrist. I don't have a watch. Look, they're worried now. <laughs> Five minutes, I can do it. All right, Cabrera Museum, we took it over to the uh, laboratory in uh, Hillsborough. Blind test. It showed unmistakable evidence with Basilio's stone that when you use a hacksaw blade, it leaves minute bits of metal that you can't see with your eye. When you break the surface, it also, because they're andesite stones, about five moles on the hardness scale, when you break the uh, surface, it'll leave uh, such a thing under a microscope, stereoscopic, high-powered microscope. They had a $100,000 microscope with video equipment. We looked at it, it would glint back at you, and you'd see the quartz. Obvious fake. I mean, they didn't know that, but they wrote up the report. Fake. Cabrera stone had patina in it, had other evidence around it, and the black polish on the outside is not chew polish for the skeptics. It's tar from Okahaje tar pits south, just like the Noskins used to use tar as a bonding agent with other chemicals for their weapons. Neil Steedy, who did an analysis to try to disprove them, he took some stones to the laboratory and he found on the stones that it was tar also that the little bits of wood inside that they found were dated up to 2,000 years ago. If you were making them recently, wouldn't you use modern wood? I didn't see any 2,000-year-old trees out there in the desert. They don't have them. All right, the third stone was this stone, heavy weatherization. We took it to a second, Palm Abrasive Laboratories, that does very, they have $250,000 worth of microscopic equipment. They do aircraft machine parts within one millionth of an inch. Triangulation, laser point. We did the blind test again. It showed the Basilio stone was fake. It showed the Cabrera stone, not known to them ahead of time, that it was real based on all the evidence and that the stone from this tomb was real. I'm doing this because always people say, oh, yeah, I know, I saw on the Internet, it's fake. I'm showing you unmistakably that there's an ancient core of stones that are real. You see the weatherization here on this, this microscopic analysis. Ryan Drum, who was an American biologist in 1976, went down to Peru. He got some stones. He came back. He took the stones, went at 30 to 60 power. He said there's no evidence of rotary-powered machines if you use a rotary-powered tool to carve these things, it'll leave chips. Also, the patina on it showed some degree of antiquity. The uh, Rothschild uh, Mining Company in Lima did studies in 1968. Based on their studies, they saw there was a patina on the weatherization. There was fissures and cracks in some of the stones, a degree of antiquity. Not 40, 100 years old. We can't date them exactly, but hundreds of years old, thousands of years old are the stones. 
Eric von Doniken did the same thing. He took stones to Sweden, did a laboratory analysis, and the laboratory analysis came back that they were, uh, there was a degree of antiquity to them. This stone shows the green area is some lichen growth. Here is heavy weatherization and patination of the stone. To sum up quickly, I look through here. Here's the various dates of discoveries, 1571. We've talked about that, 1906, 1941, 1955. Carlos and Pablo Saldi, they were wealthy um, merchants who had a vineyard out in Okahaje. They had amassed a collection of stones, several hundreds of them. Part of the stones went to the Ica Regional Museum. Part of the stones went to Cabrera. Now, I've seen the coca collection at the Ica Museum engraved stones at all of the wise guys, the secular archaeologists and paleontologists say, yes, the Coco collection is real, but not Cabarrus. Wait a second, you're on the horns of a trilemma because if you authenticate the Coco collection, you also authenticate the Cabarrus collection because of some of the very same stones from Pablo and Salde uh, are there in the same Cabarrus collection, identical stones divided up. I've examined the coca collection. They're the very kind of stones. Also, on one of the coca stones is a pterosaur. You're awake. <laughs> How did that get in there? 65 million years old, uh, you know, supposed to be extinct, 50, 65 million years. All right, Commander Elias at the Naval Museum, they collected stones. The National, Arch 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 National Aeronautical Museum in Lima has over 400 stones. The flooding of the Ica River in 1961. Many, many witnesses, when the Ica River flooded, they found a cache of stones down there, a deposit of stones. Romero gave the first stone, 1966, to Cabrera, and it had a species of extinct fish over 130 million years ago. Javier Cabrera began collecting stones in 66. I'm going down the list real quick for you. The mining company in Lima, University of Bonn in Germany. Stones were sent away there in 1968, 1969. Franken sent back the report. I've seen copies of the report, and they mentioned that, yes, we have patina, they have oxidation, they have a buildup in the, the grooves, that there has to be some degree of antiquity. 1973, Joseph Bloomridge, who was a NASA scientist who worked on uh, uh, the Jupiter 5 missile and the Saturn project, he also looked at them and examined them and said they had to be authentic. There's an aura of authenticity. Ryan Drum, we mentioned him, Eric Von Doniken, Mason Optical Laboratory, Palm Abrasive Laboratory, Laser Optical USB Digital Microscopic Study. We also did a DNA analysis on material from this stone that was sent to a laboratory just recently. We just got back the report from Dallas, Texas. And in that laboratory report, they cannot prove that it, we couldn't get the DNA out of it, but we know it is human because some of the hair fibers and some tissue off of the stone. Thank you very much.